Thank you, Lewis. And uh, I won't talk about social forestry. That was sort of one of those career moves that seemed uh, appropriate at the time of a postdoc. And for those of you who are going through studies, life is not a straight trajectory. Sometimes it looks like it when you're looking from the outside, but uh, I can say that my career sort of did this. And uh, so be patient. <laughs> and for the title, I did send Lewis three titles, so he helped me uh, pick one that he thought would be uh, uh, potentially interesting for, for you today. And we'll see a little bit, and I think at lunchtime some people made comments about the fact that um, drought in Canada or dry periods versus Spain, maybe our dry periods are wetter than your wet periods, so we'll... Uh, explore some of this uh, and um, I'll try and get my head around what dry really means to as we're, we're going through this. So the uh, traditional uh, image of what it's looked like, um, how we're moving into an unprecedented period of, of at least temperature change in the, the last um, 50 uh, to 100 years, um, especially when we look at um, the last thousand years. I mean, there's lots of variation. We can see that, but the, the average line is relatively flat with a few dips, maybe uh, associated with a little ice age and, and things like that. Actually, that shows up in North America a little bit later than in Europe. But this unprecedented increase, and, and when we think about over the last two centuries, this this change is even more um, dramatic when we, we look at the 19th century, a really cold period, and then moving into the, the 20th century, and, and it's just really heating up. And this can look very dramatic in some ways. In other ways, we can think, if a tree is living for 200 years, and it's still out there, it, it's gone through a lot of change. So we should keep that in mind that there's some persistence and, and resilience in the uh, organisms, for those of us working with trees, that uh, we're looking at. Now this is another figure that I, I like that's a reconstruction of soil moisture from the central United States and it's over the last 1200 years and, and there's a couple of neat things to look at in this figure. The red arrow is coming down or what they call the mega droughts and central uh, United States is a little drier than the part of the world I come from. So we can see that the other really neat thing is this blue line here is the average for the last almost 20 years. So the average soil moisture conditions over the last 20 years are just above the, the limits being hit during these mega droughts. So that has a, why some of us are getting a little bit concerned in, in North America. Where are we going? Is this gonna keep dropping? A couple other neat things to look at are that before the dry periods, we get some of the wettest periods that have happened. So the transition is also something that is gonna be really difficult for us. If we're used to a wet period, sort of towards the end of the 20th century in the 1990s, and then it comes down, this is, again, more dramatic. Human beings are always, uh, oh, this is a really cold winter because last winter was warm. Our, our memories don't go back that far in time, so we're probably not remembering some of these other drier periods. This period here, 1920s, 30s, was an incredibly dry period in, in much of North America. In the central prairies, there was uh, lots of problems with fa famine. Farmers were losing their crops because it was so dry. Everything was turning to dust and just blowing across the prairies. In Quebec, about 30% of the province was on fire during that decade. So it was extremely dry. So there's some reasons why we can be a little bit worried about returning or even going past what the conditions were at that time. And if you look at the literature over the last 10 years primarily, the number of papers on drought and forest has exploded. And, and 
preoccupations go oops, from Spain to a map of across the world where uh, um, Craig Allen uh, showed that drought has become ubiquitous throughout the world. And this is a map just to put things back into context. Like I said at the beginning, at lunch we were talking about the fact that this is where I'm from, Quebec. And you can look, it's got the same color as the Amazon, uh, Southeast Asia. We're generally a wet place compared to drier parts of the world. The yellows are really dry parts of the world. So this is something to keep in perspective as we're going through the, the conversation. But future projections are suggesting that this is still Quebec, that things are going to heat up a lot there, they're going to have longer fire season, drought is going to be increasing. So these projections are far down the road, but as I'm learning as I get older that things like this seem far away at one point, but they eventually catch up to us, and some of you will be living through it. And looking at it just from a fire perspective, right now there's not a lot of fire uh, annual area burned in Quebec, but as we move along using uh, the ICPP's 8.5 RCP projections, it increases, so we go up to three times, four times or more through a lot of Quebec over the next century. And since the 1920s, that period that burnt a lot, fires have really dropped off in Quebec and there's not that many. We've gone through a period where fire cycles are lengthening, but in the next 30 to 40 years, that's predicted to reverse trajectory. So the sort of plan for today, I want to go through that idea. Is drought a problem in a wet region of the planet in Quebec? And look a little bit about moisture versus temperature. The two are highly correlated, but sometimes in my part of the world, heat may be more of a problem than drought. Or at least we can explore that a little. And use some empirical evidence and lab experience to look at it. And one of the things I want to look to are some species more resilient than others. Sometimes we hear things, Pinus and Quercus are more resilient than other species. Are they really? And because I like working with insects, I want to look at does drought weaken trees and affect insect outbreaks? And then if we can use some information to improve forestry and which trees or forests are more resilient. To keep reminding, or keep reminding you where we're working from, and ask a question, does black spruce, Piscia meriana, which is one of the most abundant species in Quebec, or the most abundant species, and it goes to a species that goes right across the country, how has it reacted in the past to some of the few drying events that we had in the past? And also seasonality. This is a, a big factor in parts of the world if snows don't melt until mid-June, and the optimum, the peak moment of growth is around the solstice in June. We have a very short pre-solstice period versus post-solstice period. So this slide is a little complicated and boring maybe, but these are all the sample points. It wasn't my lab that did it, this is from the government. So we have over 16,000 stands that have been sampled across an area the size of Spain, or a little bit bigger actually, it's 500 and the commercial forest is 580,000 square kilometers. Quebec is 1.6 million square kilometers, so about uh, just over three times the size of Spain. We sampled, or we didn't, the government workers sampled almost 27,000 black spruce cores over this large area. And so the only sort of message to remember is we've got a lot of data on tree growth and climate to work with. So hopefully the results will be robust. And so this is what we found. The blue circles 
are positive correlations with spring soil moisture and the red circles are negative correlations and so when we saw this first we were going that's kind of strange that there's a moment when soil moisture is not leading to tree growth and what are the differences between these parts of Quebec for some of you it might be intuitive looking at temperature there's warmer reds here so those are warmer temperatures and drier blues or paler blues so they're drier and when we go out to the uh, northeast they're, it's wetter and not as warm cooler so this is uh, sort of the, the title part like why is up here drought or drying soil drying is it beneficial Has anybody been to Quebec? No? I, you might have seen some pictures from the winter time in Quebec. And so this is the big scoop is that in the spring I mentioned that snows aren't melting sometimes on some of our sites. Last year we couldn't get into one of our sites until June 15th because the snow hadn't melted. And, and then once it does start melting like Valencia recently, big floods, soils end up being like this for a long time. So the trees don't like growing in anaerobic, cold, wet conditions. So in parts of the world or parts of Quebec or my part of the world, when we're getting things like this, it's drying it out earlier. Anything that we can do to increase the growing season on the spring side of that magic optimum growing period mark will help tree growth so if we could start growth in May instead of middle of June then we've gained a lot of uh, potential uh, optimum growing period then we sort of looked at the same thing for the summer and the story changes quite a bit during the summer months almost all the circles are blue there's still a few weird spots but they tend to be quite far north and so much of Quebec that negative correlation later in the summer becomes a positive correlation so it gives you an idea that we have to really look at when the drought occurs and we can have spring droughts and they make the worst forest fires because the hardwoods haven't come out to act as a little bit of break on forest fires and they can have um, different effects on tree growth and we looked at it again at another site uh, another time a wet site and one of the comments about heat versus water during a period we had three droughts so probably not comparable to here it's 2006 2010 2013 and the only time that there was a, a negative effect on tree growth in 2010 2013 there were positive effects on tree growth because the droughts happened earlier in the season dried out the soil in this point it wasn't so much the drought but there was a heat effect there was a lot of heat stress on the trees as they moved from as frozen to uh, evapotranspiration evaporative demands are really high and the soils are still um, high so vapor pressure deficit was drawing whatever water that was in the trees out so these are we end up in a different situation because of winter um, than you would have here now I want to shift gears I'm going to move into a lab experiment what we were thinking on the dry sites and on the sites that are going to be coming dry how can a tree adapt to stress on the water column and we don't oops we don't want it the water columns to break and for them to be embolism and we know that for the tree to bring in co2 to make photosynthesis up to 95 percent of the water that's being conducted through the stem can be lost to the atmosphere so one of the options that a plant has is to close its stomata 
when the stomata are closed, you're not going to be losing water. And then you lower your risk of embolism. Of course, the other problem is that you increase your risk of starvation if the drought lasts for a really long period. So there's probably a balance between a strategy of closing stomata and keeping them open to bring in photosynthesis. And in this experiment, we worked with three different species and looking at the literature, it suggested that Pinus was an isohydric species and here some of the research I've seen from this part of the world suggests that different Pinus species here are isohydric or could be and this sort of induced us into thinking that it should be in Canada as well even that, though we didn't have data on it. Piscia species, Piscia glauca, white spruce, and Piscia mariana, black spruce, would be anisoidric, so they keep their stomata open and would keep photosynthesizing. And what we did, we set up a laboratory experiment. These are trees growing in the lab in a randomized block design at two temperatures. One greenhouse was ambient temperatures and the other was four degrees warmer, one of the higher end of the climate change projections for at least the next 50 to 70 years. And we had four drought treatments in each of these greenhouses based on water coming into the pots, including a control. Our hypothesis would that the two Piscia species that should keep their stomata open would grow similarly in all the treatments. And that the Pinus species, Jack Pine, that closes stomata would have reduced growth, reduced photosynthesis, in this case, um, during the hot dry treatments. Seems intuitive, seems simple. And we found exactly the opposite. Completely the opposite. So either we're not good at creating hypotheses or we don't understand the system. And I think part of it is that we really don't understand the system. We're taking a lot of information that's coming from southern drier climates and trying to apply it blindly, perhaps, to our forests. So now looking at this and saying pine doesn't respond at all. All treatments, it kept photosynthesizing at the same rate and the spruces declined. So then that leads us to a question, why do we find Pinus banksiana on the driest sites in Quebec? And why is Pinus generally is considered a more drought tolerant species? So we did look at growth phenology, the moment at which growth is starting. And we can see here the purple curves in both cases are the Pinus. The red curve is Piscia glauca and the green is Piscia mariana, so the two spruces. And the triangle sort of suggests when growth is initiated, begins, and there's about a two to three week advance of jack pine at ambient temperatures in this experiment. And even the maximum period of growth is much more advanced in jack pine. As we go into the warmer temperatures, everything advances. The spruces actually advance more than jack pine, but jack pine still stays 7 to 12 days earlier than the, the white spruce and much further than the black spruce. So they never catch up, at least at what we looked at. So what does this mean? This is our explanation for why jack pine is able to tolerate dry conditions. You remember the pictures about the snow? Winter recharges the groundwater every year. So all this stuff that's falling in the winter, when it melts, if you can take advantage of this wet period in the spring, at least on the drier sites, then you can get all your growth in and the maximum, this maximum here that happens really early in the season is a way of getting around. If your growth has dropped off later in the season, it doesn't matter so much what happens out here. So you can grow on dry sites, 
because you can stop your growth uh, later on in the season. So winter is a real winter is a real game changer for us in Quebec, and a lot of the lessons that we think we're learning from places like here, we should be careful on how we interpret them. So some of the messages: drying soils can be good or bad depending on when they happen. Understanding the site, if it's a wet site that stays waterlogged or no. Understanding that there may be different strategies employed by the same genus as you move throughout the, the world. And uh, you know, winter is that game changer compared to uh, what you guys have here. Wanted to push it a little bit and ask, are some species less vulnerable to drought? Is that strategy of pine really going to help it? Are pines, and one slide on oaks, more resilient to heat and drought? And in this slide, we're looking at growing season, maximum growing season temperature. And it sort of looks like as maximum growing season temperature increases for this species, which is white spruce, its growth will increase. But then we see that past an optimum, it can decrease. And the same thing can occur also for balsam fir. Some of the species are more flat. They don't seem to respond so much to temperature. But this suggests, again, that some species at least are controlled more by the temperature changes and others perhaps more by the precipitation changes. So the, tolerant, the hardwoods seem to be rather intolerant to temperature changes and other species will decline once they get past an optimum. And this graph is just another, well, a different way of looking at it. Here we simulated different projections of warming and drying. And we did it for two regions. So the boreal zone, so further north, and the temperate zone. So all of these species are mostly boreal species, but they are found in part of the province of Quebec that is not considered their optimum for growth. And we can see that generally, the temperate zone, which is below, generally uh, has worse results, except for this one species here, uh, Populus tremuloides, which basically doesn't respond that much, whatever the temperature increase that we um, projected. So both of these hardwood species, the Betula and the Populus, um, have very little response to temperature increase. When we go into the coniferous species, we see a different pattern. Some of the species actually increase in growth and it's given some hope to people, oh, climate change is going to be wonderful. It's going to be a boon for the forest industry. Trees will grow more. But as the projections continue, we start seeing declines in some of these species. So part of them, and these declines are going to be extreme for species growing in the southern part of the range. So again, we have to think about where the species is growing, what we mean by temperature increases, and then, I don't know if this, no, I guess, this sort of shows that some species, like we just looked at, this is temperature versus moisture interactions, and along the x-axis is temperature, Along the y-axis is climate moisture index, which is an, one of the indices that we can use to give an idea of drought. So when it's down in the lower numbers, it's, uh, it's quite dry down here and it gets moisture up there and temperature just increases. And we looked at basal area increment. So you can think about that as a, another measure of, of tree growth. So the red ones are low tree growth and the high is white tree growth. And the white area is where we didn't find the species growing at all. So you can see that in white spruce, as we saw in the other graph, it reacts strongly to a temperature gradient and has a sort of optimum around 7 degrees Celsius. And uh, some of the other species respond um, more to a moisture gradient. And unfortunately, you can't see it because this comes across right in the middle, so the animation didn't work. But there's uh, diagonal lines here which show some species really have an interacting effect. And understanding which species react to moisture or temperature is going to help us a lot to make future predictions about uh, how climate change will affect our forests.
and often they're, they're quite simple climate envelopes that we use to make these predictions. So, some of the messages depends on species response, depends on temperature increase, how much the temperature is going to increase. There can be temperature optimums for some species. Some species grow to that optimum and then decline. And then the uh, effects may be stronger for species growing outside of their climatic envelope. And I saw a recent paper by uh, Louis Kohl and uh, Aitor that sort of suggested that if you're in your lower part of your range versus high, that you were using altitude, they were observing similar kinds of things, that there's different kinds of stresses depending where in your range you're growing, which seems intuitive, but it's not always considered. This is... Um, for geneticists, it probably makes a lot of sense. There's a whole bunch of species along here. There's 24 different species moving from birches, betula, papyrifera, cedars, to more of the oaks, the quercus, down this end. And this is a normalized growth index, so the, there's and the response to a one-month drought. How does your growth change given a one-month drought? The black lines are error bars, and the blue is a 95% confidence interval. So one of the things that we can see is that there's differences, if we look just at the means, there's differences between some of the species, but looking at the 95% confidence intervals, there's more variability within most of the species than there are between species. So for 20 out of the 24 species, no difference between the species. And I think this is a really important message because often we get people saying, you know, this uh, Quercus rubra or Velocitina will be a better species to plant in dry environments. There's a lot of plasticity or genotypic variation between the species. And this is where it's going to be fun to have some geneticists helping us figure out if it is just plasticity or if it's differences between populations. So the message, there is no magic species or probably not much. So we got to be really careful when we hear people saying, do this with this species, it's the way to go. And I think some people are thinking a little bit more broadly. So species responses aren't straightforward. Some respond to temperature, others to precipitation, others to both. There's good droughts and bad droughts, depending on seasonality and where. And relationships change through time. Site important, no magic species. And I want to shift gear to the last subject area for the talk and looking at indirect effects. Does drought, climate stress, does it weaken trees and render them more vulnerable to insect outbreaks? And you guys have uh, the processionary moth, the processionaire, something. Somebody else will pronounce it for me, and I'll learn eventually. And so this is our species. It's a spruce budworm. It's a larva that eats the curtain ear foliage on fir and spruce trees. And this is what happens. It slowly removes photosynthetic material, takes five, six, seven years to kill a tree. And then after a certain number of years, we get these things looking like this. After the winter, it starts, it spends the winter as a little caterpillar larva, this big. It hides in the needles. It knits itself a sleeping bag, a hibernaculum. And fall temperatures determine how thick it will knit its sleeping bag or hibernaculum to pass the winter. So. One of the reasons it doesn't go too far south is that if the fall temperatures are warm and then winter gets cold, it knit a summer sleeping bag and it gets wiped out. So um, it's quite influenced by uh, temperatures. And then it gets bigger by midsummer or early July. It's this big in six weeks. It actually passes through its entire life cycle, but can do this. And at some point is a moth and the moths can get up into thermal updrafts so on warm nights it, they 
get thrown up high into the atmosphere and carried by winds uh, 500, 800 kilometers of distance to faraway sites. So it makes it a really hard pest to control. Anybody have an idea what this is? This thing, this thing, it's moss. Billions and millions and millions of moths. Long distance migration. Can't clean it up just with a little broom. We gotta get, this is our big mechanical broom that we're taking out there to pick up these moths. It's absolutely sort of scary in some ways when you get caught in one of these moth storms. And one of the researchers working at the Canadian Forest Service, Yann Boulanger, he was looking at weather radar in July one year and he says, hey, there's a snowstorm happening in July and there was no snowstorm. It was moths crossing the St. Lawrence River from one side to the other. There's so many of them. And now they use these radar, weather radar technologies to track the moth migrations. So it's kind of a neat thing um, that the weather radar people weren't really expecting, but this is where collaborations between different sciences can be kind of neat. So this is just to give you an idea that I don't think you get things at this scale here. I could be wrong, but uh, this, is, this is a landscape, hundreds of square kilometers of dead forest being killed by this little thing here. So to think that this can do that, it means that there's a lot of these things, billions of them out there in the landscape. And this isn't a new phenomena. It happened in the 1940s and 50s, or 1940s throughout Quebec. Wiped out that. In the 1970s and 80s, it wiped out an area that was bigger than the size of Spain. We lost billions of trees. It was a huge hit to the economy. Billions and billions of dollars lost to the forest industry. People panicking left and right, trying to cut everything at that time and making some mistakes while they were doing it. One of the other neat things is that you can see up here, it wasn't very important in the 40s and 50s. Moves further north in the 70s and 80s. And these lines that I've drawn on here show that it was mostly to this side and below. And now, it's actually above those same lines, so it's moving north and east. And so this is the kind of new, new thing in it. So back to the question, are weakened trees more vulnerable to insect attack? Here, we looked at it in two different ways. The top graph is looking at an effect of drought or moisture stress. And we looked at it for two different insects, um, forest tanner in western Canada and eastern spruce budworm, the insect we just looked at in the, uh, oops, sorry, this, that's the bottom graph. Up top, we're just looking at moisture stress. And we looked at it in east and west. And there's a lag effect. So one year after the drought, we get a stronger effect than the year of the drought. And then the effect can still be seen in the tree growth rings for four or five years after a drought has occurred. Insects, there is no lag. The growth effect is immediate and it also declines over time for long periods in both insects. Now the question is, does this growth stress make this worse? And this is I should mention this is what we're doing with the live trees, all those core, increment cores. Now we're working with uh, about 50,000 different cores from across the country. And what we would expect when we look at the interaction between water and defoliation is that if there is an effect, if as it gets drier out this way, you get more defoliation, then we should see some sort of relationship like that. When we look at our iso planes, um, these lines in the graphs, we don't see too many lines going this way. We see them either flat, so in this case, it's growth is decreasing mostly as a function of insect outbreak. And for the larger trees, this is non-hosts and these are hosts, there's more of an effect of moisture. 
And there doesn't seem to be that much of an interaction between the two of them. So does that mean that drought affected trees aren't weakened? And we published this like this uh, earlier this year. And then we were talking to some people. My wife works in, in, in human health. And showing her that and going, geez, this was exactly how I didn't expect it. And she's like, kind of like, duh. In health, we have something called a healthy worker syndrome. So what does that mean? That means that if you go into a coal mine and you sample the health, the fitness of somebody working in a coal mine, you get a lot of healthy workers. And you're thinking, why in such a terrible environment are the workers healthy? And they went to factories and they measured glue factories producing um, all sorts of um, manganese and stuff like that, that there should be neurological disorders. Well, they did find some, but a lot of time they weren't finding what they expected. And the idea here is that the workers that people like you and me would be, would have quit the job a long time ago. It's only those two or five percent of the population that's hyper resistant to everything. You can throw the bubonic plague at them, the plague, and they might survive doesn't mean that because they're healthy that it's a good environment to work in because all the people that once worked there are gone are affected. So you're thinking maybe, maybe this means that we were not looking at the right data set. We took advantage of the live tree data sets because it was easy to find with all the government workers collecting them for us. We could be lazy and sit at home and have more cerveza and uh, instead of sweating, and there's a lot of bugs out in our forest, black flies, clouds of them, you can't even, I wouldn't even be able to see you, you'd look fuzzy because there'd be so many bugs. So if somebody else can be out there, it can be fun sometimes. And so what we did is we took a dead tree data set. We found some places, actually we had to do the sampling ourselves and feed the bugs. And it's sort of a complicated graph, so I'll work you through it. We have top two are for fir, abias, and piscia in the bottom two. And the, the A graph and the C graph, what we did was we took out of the growth signal, we focused only on the climatic influence at this point. So we removed biotic influences and other growth trends from the data. And the y-axis is the percent of trees experiencing more than a 25% growth decrease during a period. The gray bars are known epidemic periods for the sampling area. So in the early 19th century and that, 19, that huge monstrous 19 easy outbreak the size of Spain. What we notice is that before the, the outbreak periods, there is a drought that is affecting a lot of the trees, especially um, in the earlier outbreak. So a lot of trees are being affected by something. And then during the outbreak period, uh, the biotic influences, the B and the D graph, we see that trees are again getting hit. So this is suggestive. Obviously there's no proof here, but it's suggestive that a drought before and these are just the dead trees that we were looking at So, in this, in this figure. Again, very suggestive. So then what we did, we looked at the survival probability of trees. So trees on the green line are those that underwent no drought stress. And we can see their survival probability is much higher than those that were affected by either where 20% of the trees were affected by climate stress or up to 40% by climate stress. So the more trees that are experiencing a climatic stress, the lower your survival probability. So one of the messages for, and I'm sure all of you had had this kind of thing figured out a long time ago, is be careful of the data set you're using and the kind of interpretations that we want to be making. So using that healthy worker syndrome, we see, yeah, the dead trees were influenced by this negative interaction. So the other paper that we published that says 
and I think the title says something like no interaction between drought and insects well I take that back no interaction for live trees but for the dead trees the ones that really suffered yes so if anybody wants to look at the and we've published both papers now and so if you want to look at that and laugh at us go ahead so the combination of climate express and outbreaks does increase mortality and just finishing up a couple of slides we also want to look at the cumulative impact of multiple disturbances so there can be fire there can be drought another terrible beetle you guys have uh, some pine beetles I think Germany and Czech Republic are freaking out over a pine beetle that's that's causing a lot of damage in their forest nothing like the millions and millions of hectares that we have but uh, they're losing some trees actually when I drove through the forest I was looking at them and saying I didn't even notice because there's a few dead trees here and there and I was thinking our forest always looked like that there's so many dead trees and the Germans were saying we don't usually let a dead tree stand we cut it down so to see dead trees is a bad sign but the images you saw of those like huge landscapes of dead trees this is what we're used to because we're sloppier foresters I guess in North America uh, gypsy moth which is a European species that we brought over to somebody thought it would be great for creating silk in uh, the northern US and it escaped and uh, has been causing damage ever since and the spruce budworm that indigenous species we just talked about so we looked at different periods and projected losses using stand leap model and you can see as we go through time and this is for the RCP 8.5 climate scenario the losses become greater and greater as we move to this period to that period and then down to this period and we can we broke it down even by type of disturbance so fire the mountain pine beetle and or drought spruce budworm and or drought these interactions drought only and so you can see in these graphs that in this part of the world right now there's no spruce budworm up there but climatically it will become available to that insect in the future so in 2071 you can see that there's no blue up until about that period and that blue generally tends to move across the country so this eastern insect is moving that way and the red one is actually moving used to be confined just out here and it moves this way anyway this gives an idea that these analysis are quite simple at this point in time and don't really take that well into account but it does show that growth losses volume losses the kind of stresses that forests will be undergoing in the future is going to be big so I want to um, do some just re remind you of the take-home messages interspecific variability can be way more important than interspecific variability we've got to be careful of average responses Got to think a lot more about populations so all the geneticists are going to be happy and uh, hopefully help us get some of these answers so is it plasticity or is it population that'll be fun to figure out really think about sites agriculturists have been talking about precision agriculture for the last little while I think we need to move back to precision forestry so old silviculturists would say we need to understand species dynamics and how to apply them to different sites the diversification thing but not just at a local scale also think about them across landscapes and with populations start thinking more about interactions think about the complexity I said embrace complexity temperature and moisture work together but they can lead to different responses and the fact that there's no climatic endpoint things are just going to keep changing so we need to be on our toes and keep changing and from a forester's point of view I think this favors fast growing plantations if the plantation or the forest is only out there for 20 30 40 years then it's going to give us a lot quicker times of response and in Quebec we have stands growing on 100 year rotations so things are going to change a lot so if we can move forward and Quebec we're also trying to 
any site that grows trees above 200 meters cubed per hectare is open for harvesting. And we should start thinking there's probably some sites that we just would be smart to avoid. We can take advantage of those earlier drier springs on wet sites. We should be planning for losses. All those interacting effects are definitely going to cause losses, so should we should take that into consideration. And uh, monitor adaptive management. So I hope those are some of the messages that got through. I just wanted to finish up with this idea that we've actually got a big pan-Canadian monitoring network going up that we're establishing with all sorts of different sensors. And if people have got plots here, it would be a lot of fun to uh, be able to put them together. It'll help us to get at certain mechanisms, rare extreme events that we only see at one or two sites across large networks, and to get a better handle on interacting events. So if you're interested, um, come see us about that. And uh, gracias. <laughs>